Hello and welcome to Topic 10, Lecture 1. And in this lecture, we're going to be learning about the right to privacy as it applies to abortion rights. So what will we be learning about in the two lectures that are dedicated to Topic 10 this week? Um, well, in the first lecture, we are going to look at the application of the right to privacy to abortion rights. Last week, um, we learned about the court's decision to I, uh, I indicate that there is, in fact, a constitutional right to privacy in the Constitution in the landmark case Grid Griswold versus Connecticut. We ended last week asking the question about does the right to privacy extend beyond the right to use a contraceptives? Does it extend to abortion rights? And so we're going to we know the answer to that question is yes. And so we're going to be in this first lecture. Uh, looking at the application of the abortion uh, right to privacy to abortion rights in the landmark case Roe v. Wade. In the next lecture, we're going to be taking a look at what happens after Roe v. Wade. The response to Roe v. Wade was um, uh, sort of negative. Um, going into Roe, there was strong public support in the United States or public opinion support in the United States for um, you know, that abortion was a woman's right. But after Roe, things really changed. And so we're going to look at what happens after Roe at, at, and states' attempts to limit the decision of Roe by passing a lot of regulations to more closely regulate uh, uh, abortions at the state level. And then we're also going to look at the attempts to overturn Roe. And both, uh, and the attempt to overturn Roe um, comes to the Supreme Court in the case Planned Parenthood of Southern Pennsylvania v. Casey. Um, and so uh, in, next, in the la next lecture, we're going to be taking a look at that. And then we're going to be looking at the Roberts Court and uh, um, abortion rights in the Roberts Court. Um, these lectures for this week are, are exclusively focused on abortion. And that's in large part because there's an important case that is um, that, the, that the Supreme Court will be deciding this term. Uh, and we'll talk about that in the, in the second lecture. So I thought it was really important that we get a, a good understanding of what the Supreme Court has said about abortion rights, because that's likely to change come June. Now, I really want to encourage you to read the other cases in the textbook that deal with the right to privacy. Lectures are going to be focused on abortion. However, um, the right to privacy obviously extends beyond uh, abortion. Uh, as I mentioned last week, it, it extends to uh, private adult sexual decisions. And so you'll be reading the case Lawrence v. Texas that finds the um, anti-sodomy laws in Texas unconstitutional, basically saying the kind of sex you have with the person you want to have it with, as long as you're both um, adults, that states can't um, basically criminalize certain sorts of sex acts. You're also going to be reading a Burgefell v. Hodges, which is the case that says that you have a constitutional right to marry the person that the adult person that you want to marry. And so Burgefell is the same sex marriage case. And then also you'll be reading um, Cruzan, uh, the Cruzan case, which is basically a right to die case. So those are all great cases. There's a lot to cover in this text, um, in this chapter this week. Uh, so make sure that you read the other cases that are um, not um, directly related to abortion rights. Um, but we're going to be talking about abortion rights and the key cases. So let's go ahead and get started. The Supreme Court establishes the right to privacy in Griswold versus Connecticut. However, a major question remains coming out of Griswold. Um, the question is, is what is covered by the right to privacy? And in specific, does the right to privacy cover the right to have an abortion? Many people were, were really eager for the court to take up this issue because abortion rights was an important issue at this time period, which we'll talk about in a moment. And the court, as we know, answers this question in 1973 in its decision in Roe. Um, but let's take a look at some of the social circumstances in the country prior to the decision in Roe, because I think it'll give us a nice sort of background for understanding sort of what was going on at that time that made it sort of urgent for the court to ask and answer this question about whether or not the right to privacy applies to abortion. So I think as most of us know that the 1960s was a time of social upheaval in the United States. The Vietnam was going on and there was a big anti-war movement in the United States. 
um, starting in the 1950s and continuing into the 1960s and 70s, there was the civil rights movement that was demanding um, the end of discriminatory Jim Crow laws um, that treated African Americans as second class citizens. And there also was the rise of a women's liberation movement um, that was demanding that uh, women not be discriminated against on the basis of their sex. And that is coupled with the rise of the LGBTQ movement as well, that was demanding equal treatment and non-discriminatory treatment for gay, lesbian, and trans folks in the United States. And so due to those social movements in the 1960s, there was a growing um, demand to liberalize a lot of kinds of laws, um, you know, to get rid of Jim Crow laws and to end, you know, sex discrimination laws as it relates to employment and education. Um, and that there is also this demand to liberalize abortion laws because women argued that they should have control over their reproduction and that they should have access to contraceptives, but they should also have access um, to abortion as well. Now, at this time period, most states had laws allowing abortion, okay? So it wasn't that there was universal criminalization of abortion in the United States. However, most of the laws that were in, the, in place at this time period prior to Roe um, said that you could ha get an abortion, but only if the life of the mother was in jeopardy. And so abortion was legal, but in really, really confined and nar narrowly tailored circumstances. Now, um, that so there's this move to, um, you know, uh, 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 um, uh, provide uh, more uh, like access to abortion in order for women to have a right to control their bodies and to co control their reproduction. And so women's rights groups that began developing at this time period began flooding the court with lawsuits, right? Um, and so that um, that's, as we know, cases and controversies. And so, um, you know, uh, uh, women were feeling that the very uh, narrowly tailored abortion laws that were on the books were really like curtailing their freedom. And now that a right to privacy had been established in Griswold, they're saying, look, these laws um, prohibiting my right to have an abortion are unconstitutional. So, you know, uh, those groups, those interest groups were active and they started bringing cases to the court for the court to hear. And then obviously the Supreme Court decides to hear those cases and to an answer the question, to settle the dispute over whether or not women have a right to an abortion. Now, one thing I want you to keep in mind about this time period, it is a time of social upheaval. However, when it comes to the issue of abortion rights, it's really not a salient issue at that time. Today, when we think about abortion rights, it's probably one of the greatest divides in the United States, um, that the political parties are sort of lined up on either being pro-life or pro-choice. That was not the case in the 1960s and 70s. Abortion was not a political, politically salient issue like it is today. And in fact, in, in prior to Road in 1972, strong majorities of Republicans and Democrats, so people who identified as Republicans and identified as Democrats, and also the parties, um, there was strong majority support for abortion rights in both the Democratic and the Republican parties. As I was preparing for lecture here, I found a, a Gallup poll from 1972 that sh showed that 68% of Republicans and 59% of Democrats supported a woman's right to have an abortion. The reason the Democrats is lower is because at that time period that there were still a lot of Southern states that identified as Democrats. But the point still stands that there was bipartisan support for abortion rights. That's no longer the case today. Um, and so just keep that in mind that, that, that the politics at this time period was not as divisive as it revolves around abortion rights. And so the Supreme Court agrees to hear two abortion um, rights cases in 1971. One is Roe v. Wade and the other other is Doe versus Bolton. And I'll let you read more about Doe versus Bolton in the United uh, in the textbook. Uh, this is a case that deals with um, laws that have a, a broader sort of um, uh, more broadly criminalize uh, certain sorts of abortions. Uh, but we're going to focus here on Roe v. Wade. So I just wanted to point out this graph from your textbook that shows the state laws in as it regards to abortion 
it, the prior to Roe, okay? So starting in the 1960s, um, that we actually see some states change their abortion laws. Prior to the 1960s, most states had laws saying that you could only get an abortion uh, in in the case of whether when the woman's life was in jeopardy. And so um, the the states that are in white here basically say that you can only get an abortion if the life of a woman is at, is at risk. Uh, but in the 1960s, moving into the 1970s, we have more states in this light gray area. So Wisconsin was a white area. You could only get an abortion um, if the woman's life was in jeopardy. Same with Texas, and that's the state that Roe comes from. The light gray cases are, are states are states that allow uh, uh, abortion if the woman's life is in, in jeopardy, but also for other reasons as well, other certain circumstances, like if the pregnancy is a result of a rape or a pregnancy is a result of, of incest, okay? So it was legal, but in uh, only certain circumstances. And then the dark blue states, uh, New York, New Jersey, Washington and Alaska and Hawaii, uh, that there you had robust rights to abortions, that you, they were legal in all circumstances. So this is the setting before Roe v. Wade. And so we know coming out of Roe v. Wade that the case, the, the, the states that are in white and the states are in, that are in gray are gonna need to change their laws to, be in, uh, to correspond with the ruling in Roe. And this is a graph that is very similar to the graph in your textbook that looks at um, public opinion on abortion over time, uh, asking the question of whether abortion should be illegal in all circumstances, legal in all circumstances, or legal in certain circumstances. Um, I added this because your textbook, I think, only goes to like 2017. Uh, and so this just shows the change or the trend in public opinion until, you know, almost today, until 2021. And there's a couple of things that I want you to note when looking at the op opinion on abortion. Uh, so for one, the blue line is when you're asked people who say that abortion should be legal in certain circumstances. The green line is where abortion should be legal in all circumstances. And the dotted blue line is the uh, those who hold the opinion that abortion should be illegal in all circumstances. Um, and so, you know, if I was in, if we were in class together, I would ask you to just basically look at this graph and tell me what you see, like what are some long-term trends you see going from 1976 until today. So that's a really long period of time. And usually what students say is that, you know what, that opinion on abortion really hasn't changed much over time. And, and there's uh, some truth to that. Um, when you look at from, you know, post -way, Roe v. Wade, um, that, you know, uh, a strong, a, a small majority or a, a strong plurality, right, uh, of people think in the United States have you know, pretty consistently thought that abortion should be legal in certain circumstances, okay? Uh, and so ranging in the 50s and today getting, you know, into the lower 40s. Um, and you'll also see that, you know, the other opinions are relatively stable as well. Uh, about, you know, 20, 18 to 20% of people think that uh, abortion should be illegal in all circumstances. And that's really stayed pretty steady over time. And um, when it comes to abortion being legal in all circumstances, we see a little bit of a fluctuation there, okay? Uh, and you can sort of see that it, it, it corresponds with illegal under certain circumstances. So as illegal under certain circumstances go down, those folks join the legal in all circumstances. And we sort of see that happening here as well. But the takeaway is, is that um, a opinion on abortion has been pretty stable over time. That doesn't mean the way that it's been playing itself out in politics has been stable over time. I mean, it's gotten much more divisive after 1980, and we'll talk about that in the next lecture. Um, but this, you know, sort of shows that there is relatively strong support for abortion being legal, either in all circumstances or in certain circumstances. Okay, so let's talk about the facts of the case of Roe v. Wade. Roe v. Wade is a pretty straightforward case. It's a case about Norma Corvey, 
who in 1969 um, became pregnant with her third child and she did not want to have that child. She wanted to get an abortion. Uh, she was poor. She worked at a carnival and that she went to a doctor seeking an abortion. She actually told the doctor that she had been raped, hoping that that might, um, in, you know, kind of have him take sympathy on her and perform an abortion because the, you know, if, if she was raped. Um, but as we know, Texas law um, for, forbids uh, the, uh, the procurement of an abortion unless it, uh, the abortion would save the life of the woman. So any other sort of an abortion was a crime to perform and also a crime to procure. So the doctor said that she could not, he would not perform an abortion on her. And uh, so the doctor actually gave her uh, the names, uh, a name of a lawyer to help her with putting the baby up for adoption since she couldn't have got an abortion and that the lawyer the adoption lawyer then um uh, turned her on to or, or led her to the two attorneys that ultimately represented her before the supreme court uh linda coffee and sarah weddington who is pictured there uh, and so, you know, the case is pretty straightforward uh, that Nora McCorvey wanted to get an abortion. The state of Texas law said that she could not because her life was not in jeopardy. And the lawyers argued that this was an this was a violation of her fundamental right to privacy, the fundamental right to seek um, medical care, um, to make decisions privately with your doctor, and also fun, uh, the, the right of privacy that you have with your partner in making these intimate decisions. Um, as I maybe already mentioned this, but Norma McCorvey, she never, she didn't get an abortion um, as she put the third a child up for adoption. She lived a, 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 a life that was a, a hard life. Um, she was poor. She had um, substance abuse issues, addictions. She also felt kind of bitter because she felt like she was sort of became cause celeb for the pro-choice movement. Um, and then that kind of pissed her off. And then she joined the pro-life movement, at, you know, as uh, pictured in the photographs there. And towards the end of her life, she died in 2017. And she actually made a documentary about her life. And in the end, she kind of felt like she had been sort of like... Um, uh, used by both those sides as sort of a political pawn. Um, and so that's the facts of the case behind Roe v. Wade. So the question before the court in Roe v. Wade was, uh, is abortion a fundamental right under the privacy that's set out in Griswold? And in a seven to two decision, as we all know, that the Supreme Court said, yes, that uh, a woman has a fundamental right to uh, privacy and that that fundamental right applies to getting an abortion. Um, make sure you read in the textbook about the complicated path of the court's decision making. Uh, the case was argued in front of the courts twice. There was a lot of the behind the scenes sort of wrangling to, um, you know, get uh, to a seven to two uh, vote. So make sure that you read about the sort of uh, that complicated path um, behind the court's decision on Roe because it gives like some additional insight into the um, uh, how the Supreme Court you know functions in terms of coming up with the decision. Uh, but let's go ahead and take a look at the the reasoning that Justice Blackman offers in, in his opinion in Roe. Okay, so what was the reasoning of the court in Roe? Well, first they 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 say that they the court recognizes a right to privacy, and they say that that right to privacy includes the right to have an abortion. Um, that the court locates the right to privacy not in that penumbra of rights that was used in the Griswold decision but rather they used the due process clause in the 14th Amendment. Uh, and so it's that sort of return to the substantive due process doctrine um, and basically saying that that's where that fundamental liberty is located. Uh, they do make clear that because the due process clause says that no person's life will be, life, liberty, or property will be taken from them without due process of law. Um, that the word person in the 14th, they said, does not uh, refer to the unborn um, fetus, okay? And so the, the person that was referred to, the liberty of the person was um, was the mother. But 
big takeaway that the right to privacy is located in the due process clause of the 14th Amendment in Roe. Uh, the court also says that this is a fundamental right and thus regulations to this right will face strict scrutiny. It's a fundamental right like the same fundamental rights of the freedom of speech and the, the, the exercising of one's religion. And so that when it's a fundamental right and somebody is trying to, uh, the state is trying to encroach upon that right, the court is obligated to provide strict scrutiny of that encroachment on the right. In other words, they have, the state has to have a compelling interest to diminish or take away that right. Um, but as we know that, you know, they, they say in the reasoning that like all rights, even those that are fundamental, there are limits on the right to have an abortion. So let's take a look at what those limitations are. Okay, so um, the court says that um, uh, that women do have, that the right to privacy applies to abortion and that women have a right to have an abortion and that it is a fundamental right, but it's not without limits. So what are the limits? Well, the court uh, basically says that uh, as the pregnancy progresses, the interest of the state increases in substantiality. And so, you know, pregnancy takes place over a period of a, a approximately nine months or 40 weeks. And so basically the court was saying that earlier in the pre pregnancy, the interests of the state are lower, but as the pregnancy it, uh, continues and progresses, the interests of the state become more significant and compelling. And so prior to viability, women have an unrestricted right to an abortion. After that, the interest of the state grows post viability and the interest of the state become more compelling, compelling to the point that it can prescribe or restrict a, a pro prohibit abortion, okay? And so the court is basically saying that the interest of the state changes over time. And the concept of viability, that means that at what point the fetus can live independently um, on its own outside of the, the woman's body. That's how viability is um, you know, defined loosely by the court. Okay, so what are the takeaways from Roe? Well, um, the takeaways are that the court says that the right to an abortion is a fundamental right and it's subject to strict scru scrutiny, but with a twist. Now, keep in mind, strict scrutiny means that when um, a law that is infringing upon a person's fundamental right, that the burden of proof is placed on the state. The state has to demonstrate why this law restricting this fundamental right is needed. They also have to demonstrate that they have a compelling interest that is motivating this restriction or, or um, of that fundamental right. But in Roe, that, that, that strict scrutiny is with a twist, as we talked about on the last slide, that um, the state's interest in a mother's health and protecting the life of the fetus increases as the pregnancy advances. So in the beginning part of a pregnancy, that the, um, the, the state's interest in protecting life is much different. The, the fetus cannot, is non-viable in the first three months. And also getting an abortion is not a complicated procedure in the first three months. The chances of a woman's life being in jeopardy because she's getting an abortion early in early term of pregnancy, that the state doesn't have as much of a compelling interest to regulate it because of the interests of the protecting the life of the woman because it's a non-complicated procedure. However, as the pregnancy progresses, Obviously, the state's interest in protecting life of the fetus increases because the, the fetus is becoming viable. And also in the second trimester that, you know, as, that, that as a person is in their, their, the fourth and fifth month of their pregnancy, getting an abortion is going to be more complicated. So it makes sense for the state to um, issue some regulations such as medical licensing or making sure that the facility has, um, you know, the ability to deal with a more complicated medical pr procedure. Um, and, you know, so the, the, the textbook talks about one of the big takeaways from Roe is that they created this thing called the trimester framework. And what the trimester framework basically says is that you have nine months of a pregnancy. In the first three months of the pregnancy, the decision to have an abortion is solely at the discretion of the woman. It's a private decision. 
in the second three months in the second trimester that the state can regulate abortions but they cannot outlaw it because abortions become a more complicated procedure so the interest of the state can uh, you know increases and in the third trimester in, uh, in the last three months of the pregnancy that um the, the the interest of the state becomes quite compelling they can regulate more heavily regulate abortion and they can also outlaw abortion in order because in the third trimester the fetus is viable they can live on their own not on their own but they can live outside of the body of the woman without medical intervention they can't go to the store and feed themselves and stuff but you know they can survive outside of they're not dependent on the woman's body for survival and so the state's interest in protection of potential life is uh it becomes more paramount do keep in mind in the third trimester that states can outlaw abortions but they also have to have a provision in there that uh, allows abortion to save the life of a woman uh, there's a handy dandy graph in your textbook textbook that basically outlines the trimester framework as, so that you can take make reference to that as well i just put it there for you to look at it, but it's uh, to, and to remind you that it's in your textbook okay so this was a 7-2 decision but there were two important dissents that you should read a dissent from justice rehnquist and a just a dissent from justice white it's important to read these dissents um just because dissents are always important to read but often dissents will give us an indication of where the court might move in the in the future right um and so that these dissents at that time were only two out of the nine these see these same um issues that these justices had with the, the the majority opinion of the court we still see those as being robust dissents in of the court today and could very well likely turn into the majority opinion of the court so what was the basis of their dissent well one dissent uh one uh, uh point that they make is that they thought the tri trimester framework uh scheme was a kind of a joke right um basically that applying these sort of three month three month three months and sort of um, comporting state interest to those that those different three months periods is um, not really workable and also that as medical technology changes then the viability might change and that you know making the viability in the, the last three months that there's there's something that is just not it's not something that should guide the decision making of the court when it comes to the interests of the state and we're going to find that the trimester framework was thrown out in Casey another criticism that they had was that the substantive due process doctrine that was used in Roe to establish the fundamental right to privacy as it relates to abortion it was already discredited and we talked about that last week about the disagreement over whether or not using the due process clause clause and the and that word liberty and expanding that understanding of liberty to include the right to privacy um that the court had already thrown it out earlier when it came to the right to contract and so coming back to it now and using it uh, that that's something that you cannot do we as i mentioned last week we still really see criticism of the substantive due process doctrine that is still alive and well in the court today um, and so that the, uh, as it says there, the right to an abortion is not a fundamental right and be, should be treated as the same way as an economic right. Okay, so uh, heralding back to um, what the court said about throwing out the right to contract, the economic right to work um, in the 1930s. Um, and they basically said that you shouldn't use strict scrutiny when evaluating abortion laws as it says there when evaluating abortion laws you just need to use the rational basis test not the strict scrutiny test strict scrutiny is the is the um is you know strict in theory fatal in fact very few laws um uh, uh are are uh, are able to sustain strict scrutiny by the court they're almost always thrown out uh, what they're saying is that the right to an abortion is um it, the it, it, so it says in other words regulating abortion is constitutional if the state can demonstrate that the law is related to a legitimate government interest that you don't need to demonstrate that it's related to a paramount or compelling state interest so for example that the state has a legitimate interest in preventing immoral immorality having sex and then being able to have an abortion is going to you know, increase immorality and 
and having, you know, sex outside of wedlock, what have you, and that preventing immorality, that's a legitimate role of the state, and therefore it can regulate abortion. That's just an example of what uh, restrictions on abortion may look like if you used the legitimate government interest um, standard rather than the compelling government interest standard. All right, so that's it for this lecture. In the next lecture, we're going to look at the response to Roe. We're going to look at the rise of the Christian right and the pro-life movement that really changed the landscape in terms of abortion law in the United States. We're going to look at the landmark case, Planned Parenthood of Southern Pennsylvania v. Casey, and then we'll talk about implications for Casey, Roe, and the Roberts Court, uh, and that what we can uh, like expect, maybe, moving forward. Thanks a lot for listening. I appreciate your time and attention, and I will talk to you again soon.